In the 1940s, warfare and conscription put the male body in the spotlight, as the body was perceived to be the tool through which democracy, freedom, and the American way fought for survival. Roughly 16 million Americans, or 11% of the total population, served in World War II, a staggering number when compared to the war in Iraq, where 1% of the population served. American suit styles froze during World War II, with new suits subject to strict regulations and rationing by the War Board. We have already seen that victory suits were available with only two pieces, a suit coat and one pair of trousers. In daily practice, a full suit was harder and more expensive to purchase than just a new pair of trousers or just a sport coat. The sport coat will become so common that the British called it the American suit. The ease and practicality of separates appeals to the American mindset, and once rationing was lifted, men will stay with this style for many occasions. With many men in uniform, all the innovation that might have gone into suit styling was instead diverted to leisure clothing. American manufacturers would excel in this arena, giving men choices not found elsewhere. One such garment is the blazer shirt or shirt jack. It is a shirt made with a straight hem so it could be worn untucked, serving as both a shirt and a jacket. Many featured patch pockets, a menswear standard for suits that now migrate to shirts. It is a shirt made with a straight hem, so it could be worn untucked, serving as both a shirt and a jacket. Many featured patch pockets. Patch pockets could be used in this case, but not suit jackets, because a shirt takes less fabric than a sport coat to make. These were made of sturdy fabric to wear in place of a sport coat or lighter colorful fabric as casual wear they would not be worn with a tie. Shirt jacks featured a convertible collar. It lays flat like the collar and lapel of a sport coat, but the top collar is longer than the folded lapel on the chest. There's a buttonhole in the lapel. The shirt jack could be buttoned at the neck to form a semblance of a regular shirt collar if the need arose quickly. And that's why it's called a convertible collar. It was not possible to wear a tie with a convertible collar, however. Compare this flat collar to a dress shirt on the right. Dress shirts include a standing band sewn between the shirt neck and the collar to provide space for a tie to sit. The convertible collar will be a huge success, giving the impression of menswear styling without the tailoring or tight fit and we find it on many sports shirts in the 1940s. The 1940s are often considered the heyday of casual men's shirt styling. Dress shirts remain the same, but casual shirts are now often made of rayon, which was not a restricted fabric. Rayon drapes nicely, giving men a softer, elegant drape instead of the stiff correctness of a cotton shirt. Long point collars and patch pockets with flaps add interest to fill in the chest area. Men wear a very wide array of colors, including every color imaginable. Wearing uniforms and victory suits left men yearning for something brighter for their casual wear. Another leisure item is the leisure coat or loafer, as it was called at the time. This jacket took less resources than tailoring a suit and offered the mix and match ability of a sport coat. It was made of heavier fabrics than a shirt jack and was not intended to be worn by itself, but over a shirt or sweater vest. Many were offered with different fabrics in the sleeves than the body, allowing scraps of fabric to be put together in one garment and most were made with inferior grades of wool to meet wartime restrictions. The body ideal for men will exaggerate the 1930s trend for broad shoulders. 
the pants waist remains high and pleats disappear with rationing. These trousers are available both with cuffs or without. Manufacturers were allowed to cut only certain lengths of fabric, so if a man were a size short or regular, a cuff could often be included. If a man were taller, there was not enough extra fabric to form a cuff. Cuffs return after the war. Uniform mania sweeps the country with workwear now being made in matching ensembles to look like uniforms. Americans give up smocks or aprons or other vestiges of European work outfits. Uniforms look modern and exude an air of patriotism for men not fighting at the front, but still performing essential tasks at home. One characteristic garment is the Monterey jacket seen at the far right in green. It is a civilian version of the Eisenhower jacket cut to end at the waist, and notice the modern zipper closure. Coats are expensive and use a great deal of fabric. All weather coats, like the trench coat, become popular that don't require precious wool. Wool coats were made, and some were infused with water-resistant chemicals, so one did not have to own a raincoat and a winter coat. Coats made with raglan sleeves, as seen on the left, are quite popular and create more ease in the arm, kind of a one-size-fits-most approach. Most of the hat styles from the 1930s begin to vanish in everyday American wear. The straw boater and the derby will be worn only by very traditional men. The derby or bowler will freeze in England for much longer as a symbol of conservative professions or ideas. The Hamburg will remain as the more conservative or formal American choice, replacing the Derby. By the time General Eisenhower was inaugurated president in 1957, the top hat itself had passed out of favor in America, and he wore a Hamburg hat. We can see him waving that hat to crowds from his motorcade. We will notice he does wear a proper Chesterfield coat. The signature hat worn most days in America is the fedora. The crown has shrunk since the 1930s. Hats are made of wool felt, so this saves on materials. But also, menswear takes on a far less glamorous feeling and an ideal sense of hyper-masculinity becomes more prevalent with so many men at war. Just as with other areas, styles of leisure shoe will greatly expand. Loafer shoes that slip on without ties used less leather. The intent matched other items of clothing, such as the loafer coat or shirt jack. Sandals also used far less leather and could even use repurposed materials. Lace-up Oxfords remain the only correct shoe for formal business attire. There is a subculture style of dressing, the zoot suit, first popular in New York starting in 1930s with black men in Harlem, that migrates to Los Angeles in the 1940s. The zoot suit began with teenagers buying oversized suits to wear, as you can see on the left, and then special tailors created a fashionable version, as you can see on the right. It features a very high waist, wide legs that pegged to a tight cuff, and a long suit with extremely wide shoulders and lapels. It was popular with African-American, Latino, Italian-American, and Filipino-American communities during the 1940s. With so much cultural emphasis focusing on men serving at war, women's wardrobes follow men's clothing very closely during the 1940s. Women joined the war effort in the armed forces, in volunteer duties, and all manner of essential jobs outside of the home, including factory and defense work. The effective uniforms migrated into their civilian clothing as well, bringing shorter A-line skirts and tailoring to more of women's everyday wardrobes. The glamorous feminine suits of the 1930s melt away to take on utilitarian or uniform style qualities. 
the princess line serves as the basis for much of women's tailoring. We can see princess lines in this suit seams that run from the shoulder to the hip. Women's shoulders grow wide, supported by shoulder pads, just like the men, not only to imitate menswear, but also to signify women shouldering the burden of work on the home front. Skirts are narrow or A-line shape, with hem lengths falling just to the middle of the knee. Women take to wearing separates, sports jackets, with skirts or trousers. American designers such as Claire McCardle created the first intentional line of separates that mix and match with each other. A woman could buy five or six pieces and create endless variations of wear. Note this particular jacket style does not include a lapel, another way to save fabric. Patch pockets enter women's wardrobes for the sporty look. Evening wear will continue with modifications of 1930s draping. These dresses are now cut on the straight of grain, not the bias. The bias cut used too much fabric. This example shows a straight skirt cut on the straight of grain with small draping details only at the neck or the hip that require far less fabric. Note the padded shoulder and short sleeves added to evening wear. The house dress, a daily staple of rural women and working women during the Depression, will now take on more tailored details, emerging as a shirtwaist dress. Shirtwaists are generally made in two pieces with a blouse sewn to a matching skirt. It incorporates a collar and buttons like a shirt. A new style of dress evolves from the idea of wearing overalls, a jumper or utility dress with straps worn over a blouse. This uses less fabric and allows a woman to change the look with different blouses. Women's wardrobes adopt the convertible collar for menswear styling. The woman at right wears two convertible collars. Her blouse collar is over the jacket collar. She also wears the women's version of a loafer coat with sleeves and pockets made of different fabric. And she wears full trousers. The rayon blouse joins men's rayon shirts as a favorite style. Women's buttons grow large in the 1940s, providing a sporty styling instead of elaborate decorations such as beading or embroidery. Large buttons could be made of materials that were not restricted, such as wood, coconut, or shell. Buttons were allowed under war restrictions if they were truly functional, not decorative. Women's blouses are darted in the front and the back to feature the waist. Many blouses are simplified in styling. We see collarless jewel necklines or cap sleeves cut in one with the body. Dressmaker details such as shirring take the place of more elaborate trim. There's an example of shirring on the right side. It is a decorative way of gathering fabric with tiny stitches. This takes incredible sewing skill, but does not require much extra fabric. Shirring is one hallmark decor of both the 1930s and the 1940s. Trousers become much more of a daily item. Photographic evidence shows us that women wore trousers during the war more than the official fashion press admitted. By 1944, women's trousers sold five times more than the prior year. Skirts and dresses, however, are still considered the only suitable thing to wear for many institutions such as schools, offices, and church. Women's trousers were cut to the high natural waist, you can see shaping darts at the top at the hip area to shape the trouser into a woman's waist. Wearing a belt was optional, and I noticed that this belt is thin and goes through small belt loops. Women's trousers are made with a side closure, not a front fly. Sailor pants with side or front buttons are a common trend influenced by military uniforms. 
During the war, there were fuel shortages for civilians, and evening wear that bared the skin became less desirable, except in the most formal events. Sweaters adapt to evening wear by adding decoration. French designer Mainbacher, who fled to New York, originated this trend. Evening sweaters for the well-to-do woman could be made from very fine materials, such as cashmere. The sweater was also a frugal way to cover or remake an old dress into an evening skirt. The idea of separates of any kind for evening wear is a new and modern thought. Women now have new fit of underwear that fits more closely to wear under slacks and to support vigorous activity. The same two-piece and one-piece underwear is still available, with another new variation including a panty sewn to a blouse to keep everything tucked into place. Women can now choose a sleeveless cotton t-shirt and knit cotton panties in imitation of men's styles. Both nylon and silk are requisitioned for the war, making stockings an expensive luxury. Women mended their stockings or did without them, wearing socks on an everyday basis and saving stockings for special occasions. Cosmetics companies created leg makeup for women to color their legs as if they were wearing stockings. Fully fashioned stockings were made with a back seam visible on the leg, and some women who painted their legs went to the trouble to draw a line on the back to imitate the stocking line. In 1941, the two-piece bathing suit is created, but considered too revealing for many communities. While it caught on in Europe, it was slow to be accepted in the more puritanical United States. It will take the entire decade to be accepted here. In 1946, French designer Louis Rayard created the first bikini, naming it after nuclear weapons tests on the Bikini Atoll. He thought it created as much of a sensation or shock waves as weaponry, and he may have been somewhat right as the bikini was not accepted in the U.S. until 1951. Bathing suits in the 1940s feature a new type of construction called a shelf bra. The top of the bathing suit is cut more like a support garment with visible cups and a band under the breasts to provide support. This is the first functional support garment created to be seen as public wear. And it is another important step in the 20th century trend of underwear becoming outerwear. In the late 1940s, Howard Hughes, an airplane engineer turned studio mogul, invented the cantilever bra for actress Jane Russell. We would call this a push-up bra today. It reshaped women's breasts into what, during wartime, I can only describe as missile shapes. And in the hyper-masculinized environment of World War II, perhaps it follows that women's bodies would reflect the male gaze. This bra actually required some advanced engineering with cups created in several pieces and wire supports. It makes a strapless bra possible. Cantilevering is constructing a protrusion that is fixed only at one end with no support on the other. It is also a feature of modern architecture. Bras are becoming big business, and by the 1960s, there will be over $450 million per year spent on bras. The ideal shape for women now applies lift and separation without a corset. The bra itself is shaped into points. Accessories take on new meaning in times of deprivation. They are small, colorful, and easy to make using small scraps of fabric. Women's magazines and sewing patterns promoted many new styles. We will see fanciful and colorful gloves, hats, and scarves. Hats are small and simplified as wool felt is rationed. Turbans enter the wardrobe for day or evening to cover the hair in times when getting your hair dressed required time that many women did not have. 
Handbags get larger and harden into the box-like shapes we are familiar with today. Pockets built into clothes were limited by war restrictions, and women had more items to carry, such as uh, rationing coupons, cosmetics, keys, and cigarettes. Women wear Oxford styles for work and walking. One new style of Oxford is the two-tone, now called saddle shoes. They also adopt loafers, as did men, for comfortable, everyday styles that are practical. Rationing and leather shortages are so severe in Europe that wartime shoes there are made with wooden soles, creating a platform on the bottom. These are a necessity during and after the war. On the right, you can see platform shoes created by stacking recycled shoe soles on top of each other. Platform shoes are not an absolute necessity in the United States, but instead become a fashion item. Fashion versions in the U.S. are made with recycled shoe soles stacked on top, and some wooden soles exist for styles to create very tall platforms. Many women worked in jobs or conditions that required hairstyles above the collar. Many will cut their hair to frame the face. The most signature style of the 1940s is a style called victory rolls, which styled longer hair into un upswept rolls. This was one way to augment shorter hair or replace treatments that became too expensive or time-consuming. During the 1940s, many women wear jeans for the first time, and companies like Levi's start marketing to women directly. Women's jeans have a side zipper closure, not a front fly. One fabric with particular association to Americans is gingham. It was a fabric woven in blue or red checkerboards. It was considered a utility fabric for aprons, napkins, and tablecloths. It was not used in fashion until this time when designers began to feature everyday American items in high fashion. There was a resurgence in old-fashioned sewing like quilting and patriotic motifs like eagles. Women's fashions featured quilting in items like bathrobes and bed jackets. California was a key destination during the war for millions of defense workers and military personnel who experienced the casual California lifestyle for the first time. Fashion featured new items based on California styles, such as patio fashions worn for entertaining outdoors. Many such styles featured traditional Mexican styling and patterns. Americans have their own encounters with exotic new cultures during the war. With Europe, Asia, and Hawaii engulfed in war, the wealthy elite are drawn to South America as their new vacation spot. Many countries there sided with either the Axis or the Allies, but there were no actual battles or fear of invasion. Hollywood movies would soon follow, showing average people the lavish nightclubs and exotic fashions. One movie star that rose from this trend was Carmen Miranda, a Brazilian singer and dancer. Americans serving overseas also discover garments from around the Pacific, Chinese, Japanese, and Pacific Island items. We will Americanize four such garments, the Chung Sam, the kimono, the sarong, and the aloha shirt. Each of these would be brought home as souvenirs for wives and girlfriends, and they became an American fashion in their own right. The sarong is a wrap skirt worn throughout the Pacific Islands. It quickly adapted to sports or play outfits and bathing suits. Hollywood featured a cross between a sarong and a cocktail dress designed by Edith Head and worn by Dorothy L'Amour. Even though she was in the middle of a jungle, it was a very fancy drape of a sarong. This rapidly became middle-class cocktail attire using printed cottons with exotic motifs. Cotton and rayon were not rationed, and so this was an affordable way to spice up a wardrobe. The Aloha shirt is now ubiquitous in California. It is hard to imagine a time when it was new. 
It was discovered by American servicemen who adopted it for off-duty wear as more appropriate to the jungle climate they served in. It was also a welcome burst of color and pattern for their wardrobes. Pacific makers quickly manufactured them expressly to sell to Americans as souvenirs. While this shirt was a novelty in the rest of America, the style stuck in California. Everyday Americans would start wearing tropical prints as a relief from wartime sobriety. The war impacted every aspect of American life, and we emerge with a sense of independence and confidence we'd never felt before as a nation. Women's wardrobes also asserted a new confidence imitating men's clothing more closely than ever. The war ended in 1945, and the American economy was poised on the edge of an uncertain future. The war had put everyone back to work, recovering from the Great Depression. But how would the economy convert from munitions and war goods? As it turns out, Americans who had been living under wartime rations were ready to spend their money on new consumer goods, fueling a new version of the American dream, as we will see.